Welcome to Journey to Justice. I'm Eiko Kusasa, and today I interview distinguished guest, Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell. A physician by training, Blaisdell's research brought to light the poor health conditions of Hawaiians due to U.S. colonization. Since then, as an elder of the Hawaiian community, he has worked tirelessly to restore independence for the Hawaiian nation. I began the interview by asking Dr. Blaisdell where he was born. I was born in Honolulu at the old Kapi'olani maternity home, which was the second, I learned later, Kapi'olani maternity home. And where was that and at that, This is in 19, 19, 1925, March 11, 1925. And it is where the Mormon Tabernacle is now on Beritania and Punahou Street. Oh! And where I think Foodland is also there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Just ever of the big banyan tree. Yeah. Big banyan tree. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there was a big home there, private home, that became the second Kapiolani maternity home, and I was born there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that was March 11th, 1925. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And where did you grow up? Where uh -huh. were you raised? Uh -huh. I was uh -huh. raised in Kaimuki. Oh. So our first home, my father and my mother, was on Paho Avenue, oh. a little cottage there. Uh -huh. And the house is still there. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. And that was three blocks uh, Mooka of my grandfather and grandmother's home, maternal grandfather, grandmother's home, which was on 839 7th Avenue. Wow. And there are about six houses there now, but at that time it was one wow. big home with a huge yard wow. and over a half dozen mango trees. Uh, so I grew up in Kaimuki. Okay. And um, where are your parents from, just uh -huh. genealogically? Sort uh -huh. of. Well, eventually I had... Uh, Two fathers and three mothers. So my first father uh -huh. was James Kelly Ko Ohi Akana. Uh -huh. But his father was Yim Akana from Guangdong, you know, Canton. Mm -hmm. oh. And he came to the islands in the late uh, 1800s uh -huh, and was said to be a merchant said to be. Never entirely clear to me until later, which I'll tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And he married uh, Martha Akiao Kili'ikipi Wongham from Maui. Mm -hmm. And they had ten children. And my father was one, two, three, fourth mm -hmm. child. And he was James Kili'ikawahi Akana. And he went to McKinney High School. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he probably met my mother, who also went to McKinley High School. And they were married and lived in this little cottage on Pahoa Avenue. And they were both bookkeepers oh. at that time for Grace Brothers, which was a heavy machinery uh, firm uh -huh. down on, I think it's now Pier 10 or Pier 11 uh -huh. at that time. Mm -hmm. And are you? Were you the only child, or did you have other brothers and sisters? Yes, I'm number two. So my hiapo, number one yeah. sibling, was my sister, uh -huh. Louise Evelyni Akana uh -huh. Blaisdell, and she married Frank Minton. So her name is oh. Evelyni Minton now, oh, okay. and she's the mother of Nolani Minton. Yeah, okay. Which many of you know. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, uh -huh. Okay. I know you later attended uh, Kamehameha School. That's right. Uh -huh. Initially, uh, my parents were able to send both my sister and me to Punahou. Uh -huh. oh. But when I was in the second grade, uh -huh. my father died. Uh -huh. So my mother had to put us into public school. So we lived in Kaimuki, so we went to Oliolani School. And uh, then I was admitted to Kamehameha School mm -hmm. for Boys on mm -hmm. the lower campus, where the Bishop Museum is now. 
1936, I think, from there until 1942 on the lower campus. In 1940, the boys' school moved up on the hill. All right, so I Kamehameha School for Boys was much smaller, military school, <laughs> and uh, curriculum was mainly vocational, uh -huh, oh. blue collar. Right. So right. at that time, the official policy of the schools was to train us to be blue collar workers. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. And they added an extra year to our schooling. So we had 7th through 12th, but we had low 11th and high 11th, then 12th. And high 11th and 12th grades, every two weeks, we went to work in the city. Okay. We had a job. Every two weeks, we'd come back to school, finish school. So that by the time we graduated, we already had a job. Oh. So, so that was the plan. So I was an electrician at a Hawaiian electric company. No, not Hawaiian. <laughs> Hawaiian Pineapple Company. Dole then at that was a Hawaiian Pineapple Company down at Eva mm -hmm. Every two weeks, went to work there, went back to school for two years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so then when you graduated, so you worked, did you work, go? No, to the no. I worked when I was in school. Okay. But 19, December 7th, 1941, oh. came during my senior year. Oh. I was scheduled to graduate in 1942. Yeah. But Pearl Harbor came. Yeah. Right? The war was on. Yeah. So some of my classmates immediately went into the war. The pressure wow. was, you know, join the military. Yeah. You know? And my mother had died. My father had already died. My mother had remarried. Did I tell you about my mother remarried? Oh, no. 1940. 1940, when I was still at Kamehameha Schools, yeah. my sister was a senior, uh -huh. Kamehameha School for Girls. My mother remarried, so okay. I had a second father. Right. And his name was William Kohae Blaisdell. Oh. And he was a fireman at okay. that time. And his father was a fire chief. Chief William Wallace Blaisdell, when I was a boy, he was a chief. Uh -huh. yeah. So I got to know him through my second father. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then when I was in medical school, my mother died of uh -huh. lymphoma. Oh. And my father became fire chief, succeeding oh. his father. Yeah. Uh -huh. So he remarried <laughs> my oh. third mother. Oh, yeah. uh, who was Minna, Cruz, Ald, and she became a Blaisdell. And yeah. she had had three children. And one of her children had been my classmate at Kamehameha. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was accepted for residency at the University of Chicago, oh. where I had acquired my medical degree. So yeah. I went back, yeah. and some of my old professors were still there. So wow. they knew about me, so yeah. they accepted me. Yeah. So I finished my medical residency there and then became wow. a subspecialist in hematology, blood. blood. So oh. I became a hematologist and remained on the faculty, was appointed to the faculty doing research in hematology uh -huh. until 1957 when I was invited to become chief of hematology at the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Wow. S okay. Right? Yeah. So I was there for two years, from 1957 to 1959, doing research on the atomic bomb survivors. So I, dis I studied uh, patients there who had a peculiar kind of we call it refractory anemia at that time, but it's since been called uh, dysplasia, uh -huh. oh. Marrow, myelodysplasia. Yeah. Yeah. And a high percentage of those patients eventually develop leukemia, uh -huh. but this wasn't known then. Yeah. So anyway, that was one of my special studies there, and I did some other research. Then I finally got out. Uh -huh went back to the University of Chicago on the faculty 
And then uh, 1965, okay. I received a call from Windsor Cutting who said he was the dean, mm -hmm. uh, just been appointed dean of the new medical school mm -hmm. at the University of Hawaii, mm -hmm. and he was looking for a professor of medicine. And he had heard about me. I said, how did you hear about me? Yeah. And he said, you just won a, a letterly award. I said, yeah, how did you know about that? Mm -hmm. He said, I was on the committee, selection committee. <laughs> so I know about you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to become our first professor of medicine, the uh -huh. new medical school. <laughs> Okay. And he said, I'm going to be at O'Hare Airport in Chicago next month. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll lay over for two hours. If you can come and visit me at O'Hare Airport, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it was arranged. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah, that was your job interview. <laughs> that was my job interview. Oh, 1965. Isn't that right? Ah, amazing. Uh-huh. So I was supposed to start in September or July, I guess, 1966. Uh -huh. And so I was invited to be uh, professor of medicine at St. Francis Hospital because the dean had already uh, begun to arrange uh -huh. for local hospitals to become affiliated with the new medical school. Because oh, it was a right. two-year medical school, mm -hmm. not a four-year school, and we didn't have a hospital, so we needed patients. Right. So he yeah. had to begin to arrange affiliations yeah. Yeah. with the existing hospitals here. And then you were head of the uh, Department, Department of Medicine. Medicine. Uh -huh. And you stayed there until you retired in, when did you retire? Oh. Yes, well, then, then we became a four-year medical school. Mm -hmm. 1975, oh, we see. graduated our first class, oh. four-year students, and among them were Dr. Emmett Aluli. Oh. Oh, and that's somebody, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ohuna, Dr. Oh. Saul Nalawai. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. When I came back, I immediately... Uh, Reimmersed myself in uh, the culture and uh, began mm -hmm. to learn the language, you mm -hmm. know, and become very concerned with the plight of our people. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But I really wasn't aware of the serious health plight until 1980. And that's when a student, university student named Melly Look, was doing research. Mm -hmm at the uh, Department of Health during the summer on mortality, uh, differential mort ethnic yeah. mortality, that yeah. is death rates yeah. for different ethnic groups here. Mm -hmm. And Kanaka had the highest mortality rates, death rates, and continued to have the highest rates wow. right when we began, right? Uh, right. right. And Piha Kanaka, pure Kanaka, uh -huh. even higher rates wow. than Hapa Kanaka. So I was fascinated. Why is this? Yeah. So I got interested and began to do more research with the student who did that study, and that was Millie Look. And I just had lunch with her. That's why I was late. <laughs> and this is her monograph, which she eventually published. Uh -huh. But the first paper was just one paper uh -huh. published by the Department of Health, her name. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then later she followed up, published this monograph. And now she's one of the major researchers in our Department of Native Hawaiian Health oh. in the medical school, yeah. uh, John A. Burns Medical School, which is separate from the Department of Medicine. So I retired from the Department of Medicine uh -huh. in the medical school in 2003. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And then Dr. Benjamin Young uh -huh. appointed me to new unit called Native Hawaiian Center of Excellence, which he had established in the medical school with federal funds. Uh -huh. 
okay. to support disadvantaged minority students. And that became the new Department of Native Hawaiian Health, separate oh, okay. from the Department of Medicine. Right? Oh. So I'm a consultant in the relatively new Department mm -hmm. okay. of Native Hawaiian Health. Wow. in the new medical okay. school, Kaka'ako oh, campus. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. And Dr. Ben Young has since left uh -huh. that department and has officially retired, but we're still very close. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but then going back to your political consciousness oh, yes. about yes. Oh, the yeah, situation I forgot to answer that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I became, I became more and more involved in uh, in documenting and, and uh, analyzing uh -huh, the health plight of our people. Okay. And then mm -hmm. I, I acquired data that it wasn't confined to health, that we had not only the worst health indicators, you know, mm -hmm. but also social and economic, right? Mm -hmm. We have the highest dropout rates from school system, the highest rates for incarceration mm -hmm. in the prisons. Mm -hmm. Right? We have the highest rates for poverty. Right? right. So it's not just health. Right. It's across the board, right? Yeah. Therefore, gotta do more right. than just focus on health. Right. Uh -huh. And about that time, in the nineteen eighties, uh -huh. uh, well even before that, huh? The so called uh, not only Hawaiian Resin Renaissance but the Hawaiian sovereignty movement began to move. Uh -huh. For example, with the Kaho Olabe yeah. bombing. Yeah. And the youngsters of Molokai and Maui and Lanai organizing what became Potek Kaho Olabe, Ohana. Right. Uh -huh, began to protest uh -huh. Uh, with George Helm. Right. And he, George Helm, and Billy Mitchell, his yeah. buddy. The uh -huh. son of Uncle Harry Mitchell huh, yeah. were lost at sea yeah. between yeah. Maui and Kahoolawe because they went to warn Walter Riddy on Kahoolawe that the Navy were coming to arrest them. Uh -huh. But they were lost at sea, so they gave their lives to the movement. But, yeah. but even before then, they had already aroused public attention. The United States illegal military occupation, annexation of our homeland. Mm -hmm. So I began to see, you know, that, that was really the only proper answer to our plight. As long as we remained colonized and oppressed, you know, we'd continue to be on the bottom. Mm -hmm. By that time, 1985, uh, Klahui was just beginning to form. Mm -hmm. So I began to learn what the Trask sisters were up to. Uh -huh. And then I came to know Soli Niheo, yeah. Puhipau, and Imai Kalani right. Kalahele. They were organizing in 1985 okay. what they call the first sovereignty, Ho'o Ku'okoa conference oh. and they got Puipo to make a film of it. So I'm gonna to have to give you a copy of it. Yeah. A film of it, that oh. conference. Yeah. I have to show you some of the people yeah. who were there, yeah. including Auntie Peggy Ho o Ross oh. and Kavai Puna Prigine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. We decided to hold a second sovereignty conference, and this time in the basement auditorium of the Capitol. Oh. And the keynote speaker was John Dominus Holt. Oh. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. And the Trash Sisters were there, and I've forgotten who else were on the panel, but a very important panel. And so some of us became very clearly, you know, for independence. But some were 
use the term sovereignty or weren't willing to commit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But we felt that we needed to keep pushing. Uh -huh. Okay. So at that time we used the term Pro Hawaiian Sovereignty Working Group. Yeah. Because we were working group. and sovereignty right. was acceptable, you know, without being overtly for independence, although later and now it's the independence working group. Okay. Uh -huh. And then the next, that was December of 1988. Okay. And then the following year, 1989, OHA trustees uh -huh. came up with a proposal for Hawaiian homelands to become the basis for Hawaii as a nation within the state. Oh. And the OHA trustees and government would become the government yeah. of this Hawaiian nation within a state. Yeah. So that was pushed by. Uh, so it was a state within a state or something. That's right. It was yeah. pushed by Kinau and uh, Frenchie, uh -huh. uh, Clayton He, and Clarence. Clarence who? Ching. Isn't that his name? Yeah, Clarence. Attorney. Who? Attorney. Oh. Attorney. I don't know. He used to run yeah. for office with flags out Coo. here. Coo. Coo. Yeah, and he's that's moved Clarence to, Ching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moved to Kamuela now. Huh? Oh, yeah. So right. they were pushing what they call blueprint. Yeah, that's right. And the blueprint, and they had this publication blueprint. Yeah, you know. it's glossy. Yeah. Thing. They went from island to island. We decided we just had to oppose it. Uh -huh. So we invited any and everybody who opposed it to meet at Queen Little Colony Children's Center down here at Kapa uh -huh. Lama uh -huh. in the boardroom there. Uh -huh. And we formed an organization uh -huh. against that. So I'll show you a document somewhere right there okay. that formalizes that and gives our prospectus Okay. okay? for that. So that's how that organization came about. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I remember when independence was put in the title. So what is the relation, what is that versus Kapa Kau Kau? Is that part of the same? Yeah, that's group? when Kapa Kau Kau came to be. Now, Pa Kau Kau, if you look it up in the dictionary, one of the definitions is a table. Uh -huh. But of course, in pre Hawley, Kapai Aina, uh -huh. there's no table like that. Right. So, Pakaka also refers to a kind of circle of elders, usually uh -huh. within an Ahupua, uh -huh. who make major decisions. Uh -huh. Affecting the whole of Ahupua'a, uh -huh. uh -huh. right? But now we're talking about a whole nation beyond one Ahupua'a. So we decided to use an area, Kapakau Kau. Uh -huh. uh, give it a little change so you see that it's not quite the same, that it's something new, and to invite all who oppose the blueprint plan uh -huh. of OHA oh, okay. to join us, all right? So, Kapakakao, generally speaking, only Kanaka at that time uh -huh. who were concerned. Uh -huh. Pro Hawaiian Sovereignty Group later became Pro Hawaiian Independence Group. Yeah. Kanaka and non Kanaka, uh -huh. meeting ethnic studies yeah. oh, okay. on the Manoa campus. Okay. So, similar organizations but somewhat different yeah. focus. Yeah. How did you look at independence? Because everybody else, especially Kauahui, was important, mm -hmm. was the big uh, organization, and they were doing a nation. Powerful. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. How did you come to, well, your, your decision of supporting independence? or? Well, because, you know, the more I thought about it, and the more I talked about it, and the more I read about it, uh -huh. right, becoming like an American Indian tribe was clearly 
not the answer. Look at the American Indian tribes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, so we're not an American Indian tribe, right? Yeah. And we yeah. don't want just whatever land they decide we're going to have. We have to have it all. Right? Yeah. And we have to establish our own, restore our own government. And we have to establish diplomatic relations with the rest of the world. We have to become full-fledged member of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. the only way, right? And we're not Americans. And we're not yeah. pro-military. We're anti-military, right? Yeah. And we're not capitalists that are continue to destroy the sacred environment. We need to become self-sufficient. Uh -huh. 85% or so of the food we have to import? Yeah. No, wrong direction. Yeah. Right? So we have to do it. America isn't doing it. Yeah. America's here primarily military base. Yeah. That's why they're here. Secondarily, make money. Yeah. Tourism. Golf courses, hotels, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. more and more tourists, uh -huh. right? And we're still on the bottom. Yeah. And we're not going to get out of the bottom, you know, unless we're independent. So, you know, I just came to that realization, right? We respect America, but we're not part of America. Yeah.